So um, I think 2017 is going to be an exciting year. There's going to be a lot more cloud than there was before. And when stuff's delivered in the cloud and delivered in the browser, it means that kids can access exactly the same experience and content at home as well as at school. Uh, we're going to see lowering costs. The cost of computing is continuing to drop and we're going to see more outsourcing of infrastructure. This has happened already a lot in the US and Canada, but we're going to see it happening more in the UK where people are moving to uh, outsourced uh, storage and outsourced provisioning by Google and, and so on. Also, I expect to see a lot more robotics and maker spaces in schools. I think schools know now that the jobs of the future are being replaced by robots and if we're not teaching kids how to build and control and manage and teach robots how to do the things that we do, then they're not going to have a great future. So disruptive innovations are typically things that, because of some advance in technology, are able to completely undercut an existing business model hugely. So, you know, think of Uber undercutting regular taxis. I think in education, a couple of examples would be, uh, instead of investing in a £3,000 or $3,000 interactive whiteboard, you can stick a Chromecast into a projector and the whole class can collaborate on the whiteboard from their seat. Um, also, you know, most kids in the US and the UK and Australia and New Zealand and the markets that we're uh, operating in have got a phone in their pocket and it's becoming more and more useful and acceptable for kids to use these in the classroom. And they're used as input devices, they've got you know, accelerometers and cameras and microphones and kids can use them for uh, you know, the creation of digital media that they can now turn in as part of their homework. Uh, I think a really cool thing that's allowing kids to see all over the world and even out of this world are things like Google Expeditions uh, where kids can use you know, a $5 piece of Google Cardboard and put their own smartphone in there and their teacher can take them to the moon or Mars or you know, anywhere. Paris, uh, like an art exhibition and anything in the world. So that has become almost free. Uh, if a school has got broadband, uh, kids can hop on Hangouts and you know work on joint projects with kids around the world. They can open up a Google drawing and they can collaborate on the same sketch and the same diagram. Uh, you can have a kid in Australia working on the same diagram at the same time as a kid in you know Belfast or Singapore, and uh, it, it's all free. It's incredible. AR and VR are going to be huge in education. Uh, it allows us to kind of superimpose a layer of intelligence over the real world, and uh, it's going to be huge. In the classroom, I can think of lots of you know little examples. So you can get a, a Tango device. Uh, uh, Lenovo have got a Tango tablet now, and you can uh, hold it up and look at a room, and it will sense the room in 3D and build a 3D map. So imagine if kids could use that and they could look in a room and it would find every flat surface and give them the equation to calculate the area of the surface. Just to teach them about practical areas and geometries, you could use the same sort of thing to help calculate volumes. AR could also be plugged into microscopes so that when kids are looking at a cell, it would automatically label the mitochondria and the cell membranes and the nucleus and so on. And we know that that sort of thing is already happening in advanced microscopes. So it's, you know, it's not unreasonable that it makes its way into, uh, into kids' microscopes or even a phone app. If you tell the phone app that it's looking at a, a picture of a cell, it could augment that picture of a cell with the labels. In medicine, you know, uh, a doctor who is looking at medical imaging, so they might look at biopsies and over their lifetime become relatively good at identifying cancer cells. So whenever you bring machine learning to that space, the computers can learn from all the doctors in all of the UK and they become incredibly expert in an incredibly short time. In education, this means that we can take the collective intelligence of thousands of teachers around the UK or the US or Canada and apply it to, for example, scoring oral reading fluency or scoring writing. So we believe that in the future, and TechStop are working on two of these initiatives, we'll be able to take a recording of a kid's reading and give them an accurate score for words correct per minute. And uh, that means that 
you know, teachers will be able to free up some time. We're not suggesting that they don't get involved in assessing kids' fluency, but we will be able to pre-score lots of content or also have kids practice on their own and get independent feedback from the computer. We're also doing the same thing in scoring writing. Uh, we are looking at assessing uh, the quality and maturity of kids' writing uh, and developing an AI to give teachers kind of pre-score documents uh, to, you know, we think it can probably save them 67%, 60 or 70% of the time that they score doing kind of boring things like counting, spelling errors, punctuation errors, grammar errors. Uh, we, we can automate a lot of that stuff away. So learning analytics is huge and big data is huge. I think one of the problems with big data is that it's so huge, it's difficult for teachers to get a, a kind of view of the data. So one of the things that we can do, first of all, is filter the data and make the data intelligent for teachers. In, in our space where Textile works, there are two or three things that we're interested in. One is looking at how, when kids use the tools that we create, like text-to-speech tools and talking dictionaries and word prediction tools, does it materially impact their learning outcomes? So when people use text-to-speech, does it improve their comprehension scores? Do kids who have access to text-to-speech voluntarily choose to read higher level or more advanced content? Do kids who use word prediction learn to write faster and learn to write better than kids who don't use it? So imagine when kids are learning to write when they're seven years old or eight years old, providing them with a word prediction tool that can provide real-time, all-the-time guidance on you know, word choice and grammar and spelling, will they learn to write better and faster than kids a generation ago who didn't have that technology? So I think they will, and I think data is going to prove that. Student data and student privacy is incredibly important, and we need to look after student data the way banks look after our banking data and our personal information. So. All software vendors who are active in the education space need to make sure that all kids' data is, if they don't need it, they should not store it. If they need to store it and they can de-identify it, it should always be de-identified. When the data is being transferred from the student to the vendor, it always needs to be encrypted, it needs to be encrypted at rest. Everyone needs to have just a really good data security policy and be transparent about it with their customers. It's so important. You know, uh, People need to trust their software vendors, and to get that trust, software vendors need to take this stuff seriously and look after it, have a data security plan.